Okay, guys, uh, it's two o'clock on my clock, so we'll start. Uh, welcome, everyone. On behalf of the Sing Health Duke and the Global Health Institute, I'm really delighted to welcome all of you here today on this new one o'clock, so you may know where we are at. Um, as many of you may might know about the Institute, one of our aims is to build a community of people interested in global health issues and gain their knowledge and kind of bring you all together. And our current situation certainly more than illustrates the importance of solidarity in today's kind of health crisis. So today's presentation is a continuation of our Global Health Seminar Series, uh, which is now presented in this online format, which is live. live. Um, these seminars are scheduled for every last Friday of the month at 2 p.m. Continue that schedule, so please keep a lookout for emails. And for the time being, those will continue to be um, in this online webinar format. So, to, to introduce our speaker of today, Dr. Caroline Lab, who we're very grateful for taking this time to talk with us, she will talk about the unmet needs related to heart failure across Asia. She's a senior consultant at the National Heart Center. Dr. Lamb is globally recognized for her expertise in and focus on causes of heart failure. She's a recipient of numerous research awards, including being the senior investigator for the Asian Network for Translational Research and Cardiovascular Trials, and the principal investigator for the Asian Heart Failure Study, which is a multinational study across 11 Asian countries. She's widely published, and I'm not going to list her many publications, but they're easy enough to find. You may also catch her weekly podcast, Circulation on the Run, and if you haven't, do follow it. She is the resident doctor of Body and Soul, which is aired by Media Corp Singapore. So there are many ways you can kind of follow the work that Caroline is doing. But before I hand over to her, I'll just give you a few housekeeping notes. One is please note the webinar will be recorded. Please keep yourselves on mute the whole time, but you can ask questions in the chat box. You can put in the questions at any time during the presentations as at the end of it, um, Dr. Lam will uh, address those. And hopefully, depending on how many they have, we'll get a chance to address all of them or we just have to, you know, kind of see what we can do in the time allocated. So with that, Caroline, over to you. So thank you and um, look forward to it. Thank you so much, Amina, and thank you so much, everyone who's sharing this precious time, probably at lunch or post-lunch, to hear about what we've learned about heart failure in Asia. And so maybe I could start by first pointing out this map that shows all the registries of heart failure that existed, you know, barely a decade ago when I first returned to Singapore uh, following my studies. And as you can see, there seems to be a huge gap uh, in Southeast Asia uh, where we are living in. And if you contrast that with the fact that if you look at the prevalence of heart failure, you can see that there is a huge burden of disease here in our region. And yet, a lack of multinational data to really tell us about this sort of phenotype here in Asia. Now first, let's remember that heart failure, like any end organ failure, is an acute and a chronic condition. It is the final common pathway of things like myocardial infarction, of things like hypertension and diabetes. So it all manifests in the end with that end organ failure of the heart. And this is the condition that we are talking about. Now to address this gap, this was actually the impetus of setting up the Asian Heart Failure Study. And I'm um, so proud to be telling you about some of our key findings now because we literally just closed our data and locked the database late last year. And what this did is collect prospectively observational data from more than 7,000 Asian patients with symptomatic heart failure from 11 Asian regions. Now the stars in this map represent all our sites and I really have to thank all the investigators for making this possible. So what did we notice about Asian heart failure? Well, first of all, if you look at um, our patients compared to American patients and European patients in these token registries, um, you can see immediately that our mean age was younger. And despite being younger, if you look at the comorbidities that, that predisposed to heart failure, like coronary artery disease, hypertension and diabetes, you can see that the burden in our Asian patients 
was certainly comparable to those in the American and European cohorts, despite our being much younger. Now, if we drill deep now into different regions in Asia, um, some not so good news for us in Southeast Asia. Look at the risk factor burden of coronary artery disease in blue, hypertension in red or diabetes in green. And you can see no matter which uh, risk factor we're looking at, the prevalence was all highest in Southeast Asia compared to South Asia or Northeast Asia. Now, there was a very interesting regional income level and ethnicity interaction for this risk factor burden. Let me walk you through this. So the y-axis here shows the odds ratio in a higher versus lower income region, where the dotted line shows the lower income region odds. Now, let's just take, for example, the Indian ethnicity and take, for example, diabetes in green. So what this says is that the odds of an Indian ethnicity patient having diabetes in a higher income region like Singapore is more than five times higher than in a lower income region like India. So, and you can see that applies to whether it's hypertension, it applies to malaise, whether we're, co you know, comparing um, places like Indonesia versus Singapore um, and, and so on. So what this really illustrates to me um, is that very, very fast epidemiologic transition that is unique to this region. And in the later part of my talk, I'm going to be talking about the lean diabetic phenotype that I also think is related to this super fast transition. I mean, here I am, you know, working from home today, uh, and, and I'm literally in an area by the river that was looking like the picture in the 1960s. There was literally no built up area, um, and, and now it's become a metropolis. So this shows how quickly, and, and, and you can imagine that with that comes the hamburger sort of phenomenon uh, where perhaps with genetic predisposition tuned for starvation, we now have wealth and plenty. And so we're seeing this super high uh, burden of cardiovascular risk factors that may contribute in the end to heart failure. Why I'm harping on this comorbidity burden so much is that it directly related to outcomes. Now, these are one year all cause mortality. And it's, it's really sad for me to see that whether we're talking about heart failure with reduced ejection fraction or HEF-REF or heart failure with preserved ejection fraction or HEF-PEF, and those are the three bars on the right, you can see that Southeast Asia has the highest one-year mortality rate, regardless of which heart failure type we're talking about. Now, the majority of these deaths are cardiovascular, and in this very special condition of HEF-PEF, which we've previously called diastolic heart failure as opposed to systolic heart failure and HEF-REF, you see that it's not only cardiovascular, deaths, there are also some non-cardiovascular deaths. But regardless, it's all highest in Southeast Asia. Now, could that be blamed on therapies? Here, I want to now zoom in on heart failure with reduced ejection fraction because it's only in HEF-REF that we actually have any proven therapies that can increase survival in terms of mortality in our patients. So now let's focus on the HEF-REF cohort. And this is referring to device therapy. That means things like defibrillators, um, things like uh, cardiac resynchronization therapy that we know can also increase survival in patients with HEF-REF. Now among the HEF-REF patients in Asian heart failure and among those who should, by guidelines, be receiving a defibrillator to prevent sudden cardiac death, we found that only 12% actually had these implants. And you can see that there is a huge variation across the regions. If you look at the graph that I'm pointing to, perhaps 
a, a good sign is that we did find that those who had the device implanted did have a lower risk of sudden cardiac death compared to others. But I think that also emphasized the huge gap in therapy. Now, why is this the case? Well, we tried to dig into the predictors of having a device, and we were quite surprised that it was not the individual household income. You know, it wasn't the family's income level that predicted it, but actually the regional income level, which means the country's status of development. And when we actually dug even further into it, you can see the socioeconomic factors of living in a lower income region, receiving less education, um, all contributed to a lower odds of having a defibrillator. And when we look at things like total health expenditure of the region compared to the out of hospital care, uh, out of hospital, sorry, expenditure, out of pocket costs, you see this sort of dimetric relationship where it's in countries like Japan, where, where there is a low out of hospital expenditure and you know a high amount of the total health expenditure being spent on healthcare, it's in those regions that defibrillators were much more highly implanted than others. So, so this really points to some systematic factors that we need to address in our region. Now moving to just plain medical therapy, we have some foundational therapies in HEFREF that are known to improve survival. They're the ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers and beta blockers and thirdly mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists. So how are we doing here in Asia? Well, in terms of uptake, not too badly, a little bit more than three quarters of our patients were receiving some of these very inexpensive and life-saving medications. But notice our guidelines clearly state that we should be up titrating these medications to target doses shown to work in clinical trials, but only 17% of our entire heart failure population was actually receiving these di guideline directed doses. In fact, the median dosage fraction was only a third of what we're supposed to be giving. Um, this has, is, is a very common thing um, that, that people have said, you know, oh, Asian patients tolerate lower doses somehow, you know. Um, these are the first data that actually show it multinationally. Um, however, uh, we did not really find any evidence proving that these patients could not have tolerated a higher dose, unfortunately. Now, the same thing for beta blockers, a bit more than three quarters received them, but only 12.5% achieved the target dose. And the median dosage fraction is even smaller now, it's only a quarter. And it very, very interesting regional differences in the way we're giving these medications. For example, in Japan, more than 90% of patients receive beta blockers, the highest in the entire region, but very, very small doses. So there's obviously a regional practice factor that comes into all of this. Now, these are observational data with all the caveats that that carries, but we did do very careful analyses with propensity adjustment to try to look at the association between the dose achieved with the one-year outcomes. And indeed, we did find that those who managed to reach the target dose, or at least lower doses, did have a better outcome compared to those receiving none or receiving only small doses. So I, again, I think this points, um, you can see it two ways. One is the huge gap in treatment because we should have people on higher doses with greater benefit. But on the other hand, it's also kind of reassuring that even small doses are making a difference compared to no dose. So um, what was very interesting is we then, you know, after publishing this, decided to look at sex differences. And this is a paper we, we published in Lancet, but it, it's, it's really intriguing. I want you to uh, look at this with me with beta blockers. Uh, these are hazard splines on the left and ACE inhibitors or ARBs on the right. Now, when the spline dips under one, 
that means that there is a protective effect achieved. And you can see that the x-axis is the dose, while the y-axis is, of course, the relative risk of the outcome. Women are in red, men are in blue. And if you sort of squint with me, maybe you see a pattern that in the men, they seem to achieve a greater and greater benefit, at least with beta blockers as the doses increase. But if you look at women, it seems that the lowest risk is achieved even with half the recommended dose of beta blockers. And look at the ACE inhibitors. Women seem to achieve very good benefit even with smaller doses, whereas men seem to need to be titrated up. Now, I left the question mark in the title of this because remember these are observational data but we actually looked at this in collaboration with a multinational study in Europe as well and found the same pattern and in fact these findings really spurred a lot of discussion because there are actually um, biologically plausible reasons that women may need lower optimal doses than men. And of course, this is never going to be able to be tested in prospective huge randomized trials. Um, there's not enough equipoise and, and it's going to require huge resources to do all our trials again, um, separating uh, uh, you know, the doses for women versus men. So these may be the best data that we have and it's very intriguing what it suggests. We further dug into this, um, recognizing this phenomenon that in Asia we use very small doses of medications. And so we decided to look at the question, how about, how about what's the benefit of combining small doses versus up, -trading, up titrating a single therapy to the highest dose. So here, let me explain. Now in, in heart failure, many of our patients don't have a very high blood pressure. And so a lot of the reason that we don't up titrate may be that their blood pressure is not, uh, is getting too low. Now, if we use that blood pressure leeway to up titrate one of the drugs like ACE inhibitors, there's less leeway to up titrate the next. And so if we up titrate one single drug, we may actually deprive the patient of getting another drug versus the strategy of small, combi small dose combinations. So let me walk you through very intriguing findings here just published. If you look on this axis here that I'm pointing to, these are ACE inhibitors drugs, uh, a doses from 0 to 100%. And then on the other axis is beta blockers from 0 to 100%. And on the Y axis, as usual, the vertical axis is the uh, relative risk. So the lower the relative risk of an adverse outcome, the better. And of course, as you may expect, those achieving 100% of both beta blockers and ACE inhibitors had the lowest relative risk. But now I want you to focus on the perimeter, if I may, of those that up titrated beta blockers without any ACE inhibitors or those that up titrated ACE inhibitors without any beta blockers. And you can see that these bars are never quite as low as the ones in the middle who manage to achieve smaller doses of each of these or both of these medications. So, um, you know, we're, we're, we really are grateful to see this and, and I think it does inform our practice that um, perhaps a small dose combinations are certainly better uh, than having none of any of the life-saving classes of drugs. Now, all of that was referring to chronic heart failure, the, the sort of ambulant heart failure that could have a, a hospitalization in the past, but when we looked at them, they were stable. Well, I'd now like to tell you about another registry that we're so, um, so proud to have been part of the leadership of. And this is the Report Heart Failure, Acute Heart Failure Registry now. And this is truly the largest acute heart failure global registry of more than 18,500 patients from 44 countries, 358 sites. The results are literally being published as we speak this year. Um, and some of these results are in fact um, unpublished results that I'm happy to share with you. A lot of it thanks to my colleague, Dr. Jasper Traum. So this is Report Heart Failure, Acute 
acute heart failure hospitalizations. And here I want to show you uh, an, the, the importance of socioeconomic factors. Uh, when we classify patients according to income, uh, wh whether they stayed in a low, middle, or high income country, we found that one year mortality was the worst in the low income countries. So the darker colors are higher adjusted mortality. And unfortunately, if you look in Southeast Asia, there's there's quite dark colors in our region. Now, are these again attributable to being less likely on life-saving medical therapies? Indeed, it does seem so. If you look at the lower income countries, these again are the three classes of drugs known to save lives in heart failure reduced ejection fraction. And you can see that the uptake is low in the lower income countries compared to the middle and high income countries. When we looked at factors associated with undertreatment um, of these patients, we found that women were one and a half times less likely to receive men, to, to receive, sorry, to receive the triple therapy compared to men. That's one big factor. Those who are uninsured were two times less likely to receive the triple therapy. Those who didn't see a healthcare provider after discharge were 1.3 times less likely to receive the, all three therapies. And finally, the most impressive factor were patients from the low income countries who were more than two and a half times less likely to receive triple therapy compared to patients from high income countries. Now let's look at some specific examples in our region. Look at Thailand. So here, the phenomenon that I had already described earlier, the mean age of patients hospitalized with heart failure was only 65 compared to 75 in Germany, for example, in the same report heart failure registry. One year mortality was 27% versus 18% in Germany. And then you can see that it's quite um, sad. All these patients should be receiving uh, these three therapies. Um, we're not even talking about dose here. We're talking about just receiving these therapies. So there is a serious underuse of medications here. And then if we turn to just one more example of Indonesia, uh, it seems even uh, more amplified here because the mean age is now down to 55. Um, that the mortality at one year is 36%. So, so you know, imagine we're, we're talking about an average 55 year old person who already has heart failure and organ failure and more than one in three of these individuals will be dead at one year i mean this is is really startling statistics especially when you match it with um, the large gap in therapy now these these differences across southeast asia and in asia and in outcomes led us to also wonder are, are differences in the comorbidity burden or in somehow the type of heart failure and underlying pathophysiology, is that what's making a difference? And so what we did is we performed machine learning. And, and this is using the risk factors that we found in Asian heart failure. So back to the chronic heart failure and sort of using a, a unsupervised uh, uh, machine learning clustering approach to say, are there patterns of heart failure that we observe across Asia? And indeed, uh, these fascinating five patterns appeared. I'll go from left to right. So there was the young patients and, and you can see the countries these were mainly found in and they had very few comorbidities and mostly had systolic or heart failure reduced ejection fraction. And, and I'm convinced that, that these are probably individuals who had familial um, uh, cardiomyopathies and uh, then there's the ischemic type. And this is the kind that sort of everyone associates with heart failure. It's, it's the men who have heart attacks and therefore have systolic heart failure later in life. And indeed we have a, a, a lot of these patients and you can see where we find them like in Indonesia, um, India, Malaysia. Interestingly, and, and mainly in the Northeast Asia countries, there's this elderly 
phenotype that have a lot of atrial fibrillation and very interestingly are more often heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Now the last two I was frankly surprised to find. There was the metabolic phenotype and, and these are patients who tend to be obese with hypertension, diabetes, so you know all the cardiovascular risk factors and tend to have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction or diastolic heart failure. You can see Singapore is there but Singapore, Malaysia and Hong Kong uh, really have a very unique phenotype in that last one, the lean diabetic HEFPEF phenotype. Now these are patients who despite being not obese, have a lot of diabetes, have chronic kidney disease in association with their heart failure. And of all these five phenotypes, I was really surprised to see that it was the lean diabetic HEFPEF phenotype, meaning a preserved ejection fraction, no systolic dysfunction. It was these patients who had the worst outcomes. They had the worst quality of life, the worst outcomes, Sadly, we see a lot of them specifically in our region here. And remember, with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, we have no proven therapy to improve survival. So this is a really, really urgent unmet need and a very unique description um, here in Asia. We dug further into this and um, um, Dr. Chanchal Chandramuli, who's at National Heart Center with me, really, really led quite a number of very interesting studies with more there than the pipeline. But please let me sh uh, show you first, let's start with the graphs on the left. Now the probability on the y-axis is actually the probability of a bad outcome. And you can see that when we graph that with increasing body mass index, we see a very familiar obesity paradox where patients who are more obese defined by an increased body mass index actually are protected from bad outcomes. But I want you to notice the graph immediately under it. And, and this is just phenomenal because it's completely the opposite direction. And it refers to waist height ratio. So as waist height ratio increases, then we see mortality and recurrent heart failure hospitalizations get worse. And this is all in Asian heart failure. And so when we divide up these phenotypes by waist height ratio versus body mass index, she described this very, very interesting four patterns. And you can understand them. They're, they're the really, really skinny ones with, with low BMI and low waist height. There are those with um, um, high BMI and low waist, who, who, who are actually perhaps maybe the, the more mas uh, muscular um, uh, individuals. Uh, there are those who are, well, fat all over, high BMI and a high waist, but look at that last phenotype of the low BMI and high waist circumference. Guess what? Those are in fact the ones with lots of diabetes and the worst outcomes. And so we're, we're now realizing, you know, there are different kinds of obesity. There may be a so-called healthy obesity and there are certainly a lot of unhealthy non-obese. When we compare this to the white heart failure phenotype, this becomes really, really stark. And, and this is comparing uh, Singaporean Asian heart failure patients to the Swedish heart failure registry. And, and I want you to see that no matter what type of heart failure we're looking at, despite being of low BMI, Asian patients have a lot more diabetes. So there's a bit of a dissociation with us. In, in um, white patients, it does seem like obesity is associated with diabetes. With us, we don't need to be obese to have a lot of diabetes. And um, if we extend this further, and this slide is courtesy of, of Dr. Jasper Trump, uh, this is what we postulate is happening, but a lot more work uh, uh, is needed for us to show this. We think it's all, of course, about visceral adiposity, hence the waist height um, um, uh, measurement being so much more prognostically important. And so we think that in Asians on the right, uh, we have a lot more 
visceral adiposity for a given uh, BMI. And if you look at, uh, for example, the white patients, they are able, so to speak, to tuck more fat in the subcutaneous layer rather than in the viscera. And then that gets even more accentuated in the ethnic black patients who uh, from other data we see that they can have a lot more subcutaneous fat and have very little visceral fat. And so those are the real healthy obese, perhaps. So these are all things that are very intriguing. We're now looking at visceral adiposity. We're trying to measure epicardial fat. We've got data that we're, we're going to be publishing soon about this and comparing uh, what we see with what we see in, in white cohorts. So a lot more work. But here is where I want to now very, very quickly round up by telling you about a tract. And, uh, Amina very kindly mentioned that in the introduction, but maybe just let me attribute this to many, many other institutions and investigators that have made this possible. And what is ATTRACT really? It is sort of taking our human cohorts and observations and deepening the phenotyping here in Singapore by including state-of-the-art imaging, genetic work, and molecular work, and including animal work to sort of uh, try to dig deeper into what we see in the human cohorts, almost a reverse translational approach. And with that, of course, the first thing we did is, can we create a lean diabetic model of HEFPEF? And, and happily, yes, we can. We just published this last year. Um, in fact, uh, it, it's called a CPIN knockout mouse. And these mice um, have, uh, it, in fact, look cachectic in the limbs and actually have a lot of visceral adiposity. And lo and behold, we, we, we are the first to describe that they actually display HEFPEF. They literally are the lean diabetic HEFPEF. Um, and so, of course, with, with animal model work, we then can do very intricate work on what do we think is the underlying mechanism. And we found that inflammation seems to be playing a huge part of it. And this is supported by work we did concurrently in SBIC and in SIGN, uh, where these are uh, the uh, human samples of purple blood mononuclear cells that we, we from our patient cohorts that we put into sign and, and you can see these Tisney plots here basically show that the immunological profile of human HEFPEF patients compared to human HEFREF patients and of course controls which I didn't show are very different pointing to perhaps uh, again a key role of inflammation. Now uh, I'm not going to go into detail of all of that here only to maybe paint the, the emerging concepts that are coming up that in heart failure with reduced ejection starting uh, from the right, reduced ejection fraction, HEF-REF, uh, it, it's the, the common thinking now is that it's a direct myocardial injury, like a heart attack, destroys the heart muscle, and the, the whole process then gets worse because of neurohormonal activation, which is why our drugs like ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, mineral corticoid receptor antagonists work in these patients. But then in HEF-PEF, the, the inciting factor is not so much within the myocardium, but perhaps systemic, um, such as the comorbidities like diabetes, visceral adiposity, all leading to an inflammatory milieu, leading to microvascular inflammation, particularly in the heart, in the coronaries, even in the intramyocardial microvasculature, and thus leading to the downstream effects in the myocardium where there's stiffening and, and where there's um, a concentric remodeling and hypertrophy and so on, and fibrosis. So th these are the prevailing concepts now. Now, maybe let me go from there now to say, how did we take it back to human cohorts and further um, studies? Well, one of the things we did is then we then uh, combined forces with 
with uh, our, our friends in some other uh, countries and did a prospective study of say, can we find microvascular inflammation in our prospective HEFPEF patients? And what we did is we did a very uh, a sort of specialized um, echocardiographic study where we included looking for coronary microvascular dysfunction prospectively. And indeed, we found that there is um, a lot of coronary microvascular dysfunction in patients with HEFPEF. And these are patients not with macrovascular coronary disease, but with microvascular dysfunction. And so this really points to, could this be a target? Well, back to Asian heart failure, we said, well, okay, how about in the lean diabetic? Is there something that we can tease out in our observational studies that perhaps have PEF uh, may be related to microvascular disease? And indeed, when we looked at our diabetic cohort, we found a strong correlation with have PEF and the presence of microvascular disease in other disease beds like retinopathy, nephropathy, neuropathy in our patients with diabetes. And all this really suggests that this kind of heart failure may be a manifestation of systemic microvascular disease and diabetes, which is, which is important. And notice we, we published this in Diabetes Care um, uh, last year, not, not in a cardiovascular journal, because it says to endocrinologists and all of us really, that we should stop thinking of heart disease and diabetes as a macrovascular disease of heart attack and systolic heart failure. That by the time you have microvascular disease and albuminuria, you should also be thinking about the heart because it may also be affected by microvascular disease and developing heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, which has a, also a very bad prognosis. It's not just reduced ejection fraction heart failure. Now, therapeutically, what does this mean? Well, okay, these, these are data we haven't published yet, but we're putting together because in, in all the, the more deeper studies we did in a tract, we found that myeloperoxidase, back to that inflammation uh, uh, pathway, myeloperoxidase may be a microvascular culprit in these patients with HEFPEF. We found that levels of MPO or myeloperoxidase activity and mass were higher in HEFPEF compared to controls and even higher in HEFPEF compared to HEFREF. We had genetic uh, data to support that um, uh, it, the inheritance of um, abnormalities in the MPO promoter could be associated with reduced coronary flow reserve and poor prognosis um, in, in the cardiovascular disease. Um, and we had also data from a tract showing that, that these, these polymorphisms may be associated with HEFPEF in particular in our tract cohort. I mean, that's cutting a long story short, but basically we are doing an early phase trial of myeloperoxidase inhibition in HEFPEF. Uh, the clinicaltrials.gov identifier is listed at the bottom, but you know, really exciting how this, this can really go from reverse translation and translate back to the bedside. Just one more thing I want to mention, and that is, you know, I said that we did state-of-the-art imaging. Uh, we, we even, in a tract, developed a, um, a, a patented ketone probe uh, that, that could be used to look at myocardial metabolism, including ketone metabolism. And, and once you mention that, I mean, those of us who, who read a lot about that know that uh, that's a really hot topic in the setting of these kinds of drugs called sodium glucose co-transporter 2 inhibitors or the SGLT2 inhibitors, empagliflozin being an example. And so we were able to use this technology to sort of look at the the effect of SGLT2 inhibition on um, a myocardial metabolism um, and, and findings such as these support also what we saw in our patient cohorts. Uh, this is, is a large, um, uh, this is the CVD Real 2 study, a collaboration with many, many um, other countries and investigators. I really, really want to mention Dr. Bi Yong Mong uh, from SGH, Dr. Yo Kong Kyong from NHCS, who really made this study possible. And it's basically looking at the association of SGLT2 inhibitors 
versus the use of other oral hypoglycemic agents in our patients with diabetes, now it's diabetes, not heart failure, with diabetes, and showing whether or not they are associated with a reduced risk of death or heart failure hospitalization in our own patients. And you can see here, no matter how you cut it, you can see that using an SGLT2 inhibitor, and you can see I'm pointing to our Singapore strata here, certainly seems protective with regards to heart failure hospitalization, the combination outcome of death and heart failure hospitalization. And when we zoom in on heart failure hospitalization, whether or not you had a history of heart failure, whether or not you're on concurrent therapy with ACE inhibitor, or or beta blockers, SGLT2 inhibitors seem to help in these patients with diabetes. And where I'm going here is my final slide to show you the next phase of what um, we're, we're really excited about at the National Heart Center. We're leading another now multinational prospective study about to enroll any time our first patient where we're now going upstream recognizing that that lean diabetic hepatic phenotype is really a huge problem here in our region that we don't have therapies to treat it but perhaps we could go upstream to prevent it and so this is the rationale of our adopt trial where we are going to try to identify patients with type 2 diabetes at high risk of developing cardiovascular outcomes by using a biomarker and that's nt Pro BNP. These high risk patients will then be randomized to an intensive strategy, presentive preventive strategy of up titration of ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, mineral corticoid receptor antagonists, and preferential use of SGLT2 inhibitors compared to standard of care. And we really hope to show that such an intensive treatment strategy will prevent cardiovascular outcomes in our patients with diabetes. And so in summary, I hope I've, I've uh, managed to show you this large burden of heart failure in Asia with striking regional differences. Here in Southeast Asia, we have the youngest patients and yet with the worst outcomes. There are urgent gaps in treatment that need to be addressed and these must be addressed along with socioeconomic considerations. The unique lean diabetic heart failure phenotype really represents an opportunity to further understand the role of visceral adiposity and microvascular inflammation in this disease. And you know, while we try to understand that and, and look for new therapies, I think prevention is really, really key and what we're very, very excited about now. And with that, thank you so much and thank you to everybody um, who has made all this work possible. Thanks, Amina. Oh, thanks, Caroline. That was great. A lot to absorb. So <laughs> it's good that this is recorded and hopefully people will you know, have a chance to even go back and listen to some of the points. But that was really very comprehensive. Uh, we have uh, a few questions which were posted in advance. So uh, if people have questions, you can put it in your the little chat box. But in the meantime, maybe, Karen, you could address some of the questions that were sent in advance. Now, do you have them already or should I um, give them to you? Oh. I think I have some of them here. Mariel was was uh, uh, very kind to to already share that. Okay. Um, uh, there was an interesting uh, a question on you know uh, what are the preventive strategies and effective tests for both men and women. Um, I I would say you know you've seen the risk factor burden. What I what I didn't show you was that um, we also have published that women are more predisposed to the lean diabetic heart failure phenotype than men. Uh, we, we unfortunately um, have more cardiac remodeling, more renal impairment um, at lower BMIs compared to men. Uh, and you know, that, that really uh, pains me. Um, and, and so I, I really think the preventive strategies though, um, maybe things that are familiar to everyone already, which is you know, we, we have to be able to manage these risk factors well. Um, and luckily, especially for diabetes, we now have the emergence of, of drugs that actually prevent heart failure outcomes. And that would be, for example, the SGLT2 inhibitors that, that the, the data really look robust. The other are, of course, the GLP-1 um, um, uh, agents that also prevent atherosclerotic uh, uh, 
diseases in patients with type 2 diabetes. So it's the good management of risk factors like diabetes, hypertension, um, it's the secondary preventive measures in patients who've already had a heart attack. Um, these are all very important in the prevention of heart failure because they all lead to heart failure. And so those would be the things that I would um, uh, emphasize in both women and men. Um, yeah, great. So um, there were a couple of other questions. Um, there's one, can early advanced care planning have a useful role in heart failure management? Yes, for sure. Um, I did not touch on that because um, um, our uh, data were not focused on the severe uh, end stage heart failure patients, but this is a very, very important component um, of heart failure management. Now, uh, as, as you can see, if, if we have a mortality rate that's about 10% in one year, in five years, 50% of patients are dead. If I could say that again, half of our heart failure patients may be dead in five years. Now, if, if that doesn't seem alarming, um, I can tell you that that kind of prognosis rivals that of most cancers. And, and yet, patients, public, don't take this condition seriously. I mean, there's a lot of non-compliance with medications. People complain about medications they have to take and they don't realize nobody ever says that with cancer. Um, and, and, uh, and, and the other thing therefore to also become very important is to talk about end of life and, and, and what to do. Um, so advanced car care planning is, is really critical. I, I have to admit that while I was presenting the data on the low device use, um, if it were me uh, with, with end-stage heart failure, um, there are considerations that, that perhaps with a very short uh, lifespan left, I may not want a device. Um, it's expensive, especially in, in areas where we have to pay out of pocket. And um, frankly, a sudden cardiac death may not be the worst way to go. I hate to say this, but these are conversations we have to have with our patients. Um, and, and I think also just having a conversation like that uh, really helps them to understand to the severity of what, what they're facing. And, and I think one of the biggest problems we have is um, we just don't take heart failure seriously enough. Yeah. Um, maybe this ties into another question which they talk about where they ask uh, what is unique about the management and kind of multidisciplinary care for Asian patients. So is that something that you think, uh, you know, is, uh, are there some things particular to Asian patients that, uh, you know, can be maybe improved or, you know, just uh, addressed? Yeah, thank you for that question too. So, so um, my, my answer really stems from the very, uh, the more unique aspects of our patients that I've already observed. For example, they're young, right? Now, you know, so, so our heart failure clinics and, and our multidisciplinary approach, it's never too early to start, um, you know, preventive strategies against heart failure in patients with heart disease. It's never too early, I think, to even start screening for risk factors for heart disease in general. We have to realize in our Asian context, we have patients coming with heart attack very young. We have patients who can be diabetic who are not fat. Uh, you, you don't need to be obese to have high cholesterol and to be at risk for um, a heart attack. You, you will not feel if you have high blood pressure. Don't wait till you feel it because what you will feel is either a stroke or a, a cardiac event. You know, so all these things say that the multidisciplinary care means starting early with preventive measures. And then in, in sort of those who already have established heart failure, there are certain considerations. There's this pervasive idea of using small doses. Um, it, you know, I, I have to admit, I'm, I'm a practicing doctor. I, I also get scared about using high doses in my little Asian uh, ladies with very low BMI and so on. But if we really, really dig, dig deep, there's 
very little actual evidence that our patients cannot tolerate. And so I think we need to sort of get over that a little bit and, and try to be more aggressive um, in, in our approach. And patients recognizing how severe their disease is must be more open to, to, to more medications. Uh, it, you know, the, the commonest question I get in clinic is, oh, oh, does that mean I now have to take it for the rest of my life? You know, when I say they've got high blood pressure or they have diabetes or, or they have heart failure. And it's like, yes, of course, because it's, it, it helps prevent the thing that is going to kill you. You know, so um, I, I think we, we really need to get these messages out in, in Asia. Um, and then one more thing that I found very interesting is when we dug into why there's so little device use in our Asian patients, very interestingly, there was also in, in a questionnaire type of a, a format that we did, um, people don't want, they, they see a, a defibrillator as invasion of the body somehow. Um, it's a very different mentality from what I've seen in the West. Uh, so, so patients here are very averse, especially the elderly, to an invasive procedure. Um, but but I, I do think that while we are aware of the different cultural implications of things like that, we also need to clarify mis misunderstandings or concepts that are not quite right because a defibrillator is only under the skin. It, it's, it's not cutting the entire chest open. Uh, and, and I think we need to bring those considerations in when we talk to our Asian patients. So I, I think those are the unique aspects of practicing here. So um, someone's actually sent me a question, which is kind of the flip side of, you know, what you're talking about, the need to take, medicate at the right level. They've asked the question about what about the usual kind of more um, preventive medicine uh, uh, actions of exercise and diet and all those things that you would, you know, generally say, oh, these are good uh, things to do to keep you, um, when you're diabetic, you know, similarly, you, you uh, advise this, what role does that play? And maybe uh, they didn't ask this question, but maybe balance that with the need for, you know, medication versus lifestyle modification, you know, how do we approach these two kind of uh, poles? I couldn't be more grateful for that question. So thank you. Now remember, I'm a heart failure specialist, right? So it's, so it's like it's like talking to someone who sees the patients way down the line, and and I am trying to get further upstream. But but you are absolutely right that right at the start of all of that is lifestyle uh, modification. That is the absolute basis of everything uh, that we do in cardiovascular risk management is literally, it's never um, um, medicines or lifestyle. It's always lifestyle and then what do we do? And in diabetes, that is extremely, extremely important. But I think as all of us know, oh, it's, it's just one of the hardest things to actually prescribe. Uh, you know, I, I could say to my face turns blue that, that we need to exercise more regularly, we need to watch what we eat, um, but it's really sometimes, you know, easier said than done. Um, and I think we, we, we all understand that, but that doesn't mean uh, it, it, it shouldn't be emphasized. Now, in, in my sort of saying that, you know, when I talk to patients about once they start medications, they should expect to to, to need it chronically. I, I can tell you personal anecdotes of patients with whom I have taken medications off. And uniformly, those are the patients who got control of their lifestyles and lost a ton of weight, their high blood pressure disappeared, their diabetes disappeared. And I am the first to want to take them off medications uh, uh, for any of those things. Um, uh, just just to, to point out, though, that that is in risk factor management, but in heart failure itself, it's a very, very different uh, uh, situation. In, in heart failure, once that remodeling has started, the myocardium has already suffered damage, we don't take the medications off. 
remember, this is end organ heart failure already. There has been a study called TRED HF, very bold study, not performed here, that actually randomized patients with so-called stable heart failure into taking off the medications versus not. It, it, it immediately stopped early and it was, I mean, patients immediately, you know, got worse and, and so on. So a very, very bold study needed needed to be done for the world to prove it um, simply because of questions like this. But, but you know, very clear answer, you don't go off it. Once once it, it helps stabilize, it's almost like, you know, having a chemotherapy that keeps, that, that, that keeps the, the abnormality at bay, it, it, we should continue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, maybe we have time for one more question where someone asks, um, can you explain that uh, in the example of Indonesia where medical therapy is more and better utilized than in Thailand, but the outcomes and risks remain higher. So I don't know if you can speak to those are pretty specific uh, countries they pointed to. So if you can't, it's okay, but uh, since they asked, I... Yeah, so thank you for that question. And, and uh, that was very insightful. I think you noticed that there seemed to be more of the triple therapy in Indonesia versus Thailand, and yet the, the outcomes were worse. And, and, and this is exactly why I was uh, sort of leading to, it made us wonder whether the type of heart failure that we're talking about differed between the regions. Um, and indeed we saw, I mean, in, in the in Indonesian population, it seemed to be a lot of very early heart attacks and so on. And in Thailand, it was a little bit different. Um, it could be more of the familial type of cardiomyopathy, which has a better outcome, non-ischemic. So, so, so one is the type of, of heart failure. Um, and then of course, there is this whole lot of unexplained, um, that, that we always say in every manuscript, you know, we, it, the model only explains this much. There's a whole lot more that, it, that must be socioeconomic factors, factors that we just have not measured in our studies. And I really think those are very, very important to address. Absolutely. So um, I think uh, we can kind of wrap up here. Uh, I just say thank you again. That was really excellent. Lots of information, lots of things to absorb. And I hope everyone listening, you know, kind of uh, appreciated all the complexities that were revealed across the different countries. So um, thank you again. Uh, it was great to see you. And um, till next time. And for everyone else, we will look out for our next um, webinar. Uh, series, which will actually, I did say it was the last Friday of every month, but since next month, the last Friday is a holiday, we'll go the Friday previously. So we'll actually be, if I'm not wrong, the 24th of July instead of the 31st of July. So uh, thank you, Caroline. Thank you. Thank all. you so much, Amina. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.